I'd like to talk with you this evening on the subject highlights of the Apocrypha stories. And this will be a one talk condensation of a series that I'll be giving in my own church next week during our tabernacles. Highlights of the Apocrypha stories. And let's begin first with some background information. The Apocrypha is a word that means hidden or secret. And it's a word, it's a Greek word that's even found in the New Testament. In Colossians 2 verse 3 says, in whom are, notice the present tense, in whom are hid, apocalyptos, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It has wrongly been taken uh, on the meaning of something that is spurious or fraudulent. And that is, is unfortunately and, and not correct. But because of that, many people avoid it. 13 of the 14 books of the Apocrypha were included in the Alexandrian canon known as the Septuagint, which was used by our Lord and his disciples exclusively. They did not use the Masoretic text that we, uh, most of our Bible ver English Bible versions are based on today. And all 14 of the Apocrypha books were included in the King James Bible yes. for 274 years until, uh, until 1885, according to the King James Bible Online website. And the first complete English Bible was Miles Coverdale in 1535, which did not include the Apocrypha. Uh, the reason was he stated that it contained dark sentences. In other words, hard to understand. The first English Bible to contain the Apocrypha was the Thomas Matthew Bible of 1537. And the Geneva Bible went through 230 editions between 1560 and 1630. It contained the Apocrypha and placed the prayer of Manasseh into the Hebrew Bible section of Second Chronicles. And of course, the pilgrims and the Puritans of early America exclusively used the Geneva Bible, uh, which is another of the old translations here. Uh, the 1611 King James Bible had 113 marginal references to the Apocrypha, 102 in the Old Testament and 11 in the New Testament. And you could take a look at this photographic reproduction of the original 1611 Bible that I have, and you'll see in the margins here references many times to the Apocrypha. For example, Luke 1631 uh, references Tobit 416, Luke 1413 references Tobit 47, Matthew 2337 references 2nd Ezra 130. And there are many, many other examples. The Council of Trent met at Tridentum, Italy, between 1545 and 63, and pronounced an anathema on anyone who would not accept the Latin Vulgate with its apocrypha as sacred and canonical. The council members didn't argue at all about that. Uh, they did instead argue about such things as whether it's allowable to eat cheese during Lent. That was quite an argument over that. My goodness. <laughs> yes, true story. I love cheese. German reformer Martin Luther rejected certain books of the Apocrypha because they seemed to support the doctrine of purgatory and prayers and masses for the dead, such as 2 Maccabees 12, 43-45, and we're not going to turn to these in the interest of time. You can go back later and look them up. It also lends support to the idea of achieving, achieving merit for good works, as in Tobit 12.9, Ecclesiasticus 3.30, 2 Ezra 8.33, and 2 Ezra 13.46. Luther was a strict believer in salvation by faith alone, Amen. apart from works. I believe that the Bible supports degrees of reward or punishment due to our work, however. And, uh, but that, too, was not a part of Luther's theology. Hmm. 
The Septuagint, including the Apocrypha, was translated in the third century BC for Jewish believer, for Jews living in Alexandria, Egypt, who could not read Hebrew. They only spoke Greek. Yet the Jews later stopped using the Septuagint because the Christians adopted it. And so they suddenly didn't want to have anything to do with the Apocrypha anymore because the hated Christians used it. It's uh, much akin to the fact that the Jews threw out their original Proto-Hebraic alphabet in its entirety because the hated Samaritans adopted it. And so in about the second or third century BC, the Jews adopted a brand new alphabet, the square Hebrew characters that you see now as, as the Hebrew alphabet. That's relatively recent. That was not biblical Hebrew. Yeah. The original Septuagint included Psalm 151, which is now only found in printings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I have a copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I didn't bring with me uh, today. The early Christian scholar Jerome said that many in his day wanted to reject the New Testament book of Jude because it quoted a verse from the book of Enoch which is not in the Apocrypha, by the way. And they're mentioning Jude verses 14 and 15, which quote e first Enoch 1.9. So because he quoted Enoch, uh, they wanted to throw out the book of Jude. However, the Apostle Paul quoted a line from the Greek play Thais by the pagan poet Menander in 1 Corinthians 15.33, and no one wants to throw out Paul or 1 Corinthians. Paul at Athens quoted the pantheistic hymn to Zeus by the Stoic philosopher Cleanthes in Acts 17, 28. And additionally, Titus 1.12 quotes the Greek pagan writer Epimenides, Epimenides <laughs> about the Cretans being liars. I'm sure you've probably come across that verse. William Shakespeare named his two daughters after the heroines of the Apocrypha. And do you know who those two heroines were? One is Susanna, and one is Judith. And they're popular names in Christendom even the, today. Uh, we have a Susanna with us in the audience today, and my sister's name was Suzanne, which is a variation of Susanna. And my mother's name was Anna, which is a shortened form of Susanna. Uh, Shakespeare, in his writings, borrowed from 11 of the 14 apocryphal books. So he didn't have any problem at all uh, giving credence to the apocrypha. It is a little known fact, you might find interesting, that British sovereigns are crowned holding a Bible which must contain the Apocrypha in its entirety. And a rather embarrassing oh. incident happened in 1907 during the crowning of King Edward VII, Queen Victoria's son, yeah. when they placed in his hands a beautifully bound leather copy of the Bible. And to their horror, they noticed it did not contain the Apocrypha. <laughs> So they rejected it, and they had to scurry around and find a Bible with the Apocrypha in it to hand to King Edward VII for his crowning ceremony, because it had to contain the Apocrypha. And the sad thing was that original fancy brown bound Bible was prepared by the London Bible Society, and they didn't include the Apocrypha. You'd think they would have, would have known yeah. it had to be re required, but, but they didn't. And stories about the Apocrypha figure prominently in Christian art. Dozens of paintings in museums around the world feature especially, especially three of the heroes in the Apocrypha, Judith, Tobith, and Susanna. The British National Gallery displays a wonderful painting, Tobias and the Angel, by the Renaissance painter Domenicino. Dominicino, and I have at home a copy uh, of the uh, 
British National Gu Gallery guidebook, which has color pictures and it has <coughs> this beautiful painting of Tobias and the angel. Uh, sorry, I should have brought it with me. Uh, and they also have there at the National Gallery a painting called Susanna and the Elders, which was a popular subject in, in Renaissance paintings by Rennie and Karachi. But you don't need to travel that far from home to see paintings of the Apocrypha. You can go to our own Detroit Institute of Arts Museum, as I took my family last year, and we enjoyed seeing the famous painting called Judith with the Head of Holofernes. It's quite a painting. It shows <laughs> Judith holding up the severe head of Holofernes. Quite a painting, and it's, it's on display at the Detroit Institute of Arts, along with lots of other wonderful artwork. It was painted by a artist named Titian. It's pronounced T-I-T-I-A-N and pronounced Titian. He was, in fact, the greatest Venetian Renaissance painter of them all. And you can see his wonderful work there at Detroit's Institute of Arts. One last introductory comment. Uh, the Apocrypha has been the subject of furious debate over its worthiness. The Roman Catholic Council of Trent, which met at Tridentum, Italy, of course, pronounced it anathema if you didn't accept it. But conversely, in the early 19th century, the Edinburgh Bible Society denounced the Apocrypha and forbade its circulating. And their strong attack began the process of publishers leaving out in the 19th century the Apocrypha. Uh, and of course, there was another reason why they left it out too, is because it made the published Bible lighter to carry and cheaper to produce. <laughs> so he always had that, that incentive as well. So let's begin with the first of the 14 books of the Apocrypha, which is First Ezra. And this book begins with the great Passover of 1622 BC in the 18th year of King Josiah. Josiah's actual Hebrew name was Yoshiahua, meaning healed or supported by God, by Yah. Amen. And it, he had, as many of the kings did, he had, his, he had the sacred name of God in his name, Yahuwah. People don't realize it, but the name Yahweh actually was a later development. And I have all of the scholarly references about this on one of my websites at sacred-name.info if you want to pursue that. So this uh, great Passover 622 BC was a full century after the House of Israel was exiled by Assyria and a quarter century before the Babylonian conquest and destruction of Jerusalem. First Ezra retells the account in uh, 2 Chronicles 35 to 36, and then an overview of all the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah in chapters 7 and 8 of Nehemiah, up to the public reading of the Torah law by Ezra. This history covers from 622 BC, before the Babylonian captivity of Judah, until the restoration of Judah about 444 BC. And some scholars believe the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in our Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, were derived from first Ezra. Others think they're all derived from a common lost original. Jewish historian Flavius Josephus preferred to use the apocryphal book of first Ezra rather than the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in our Old Testament for his history of the period. Now, the central story of First Esdras in chapters 3 through 5 is an interesting tale called The Tale of the Three Guardsmen. And as the story goes, three guardsmen, young men of the bodyguard of the Persian king, were sitting around bored with their guard duty when they came up with a little mind game. They said, let's have a contest Let's figure out what is the most powerful thing in the world. What is the strongest thing 
in the world. And their debate about this found its way to the king's chamber where he wanted to know the results of their little debate. <clears throat> and after time for consideration, the first guardsman said, well, the strongest thing in the world, obviously, my friends, is wine. Because wine has the same effect on everyone that drinks it, regardless of their station in life. That was his argument. And the second one said, no, that's not the answer. The strongest thing in the world is the king. Because the king has control over everybody in his kingdom. He can order anyone around. He's the only one in the kingdom that everyone has to obey. So, gentlemen, why is not the king the strongest? Since he has to be obeyed in this fashion. Chapter 4, verse 12. Well, the third guardsman said, no, you're both wrong. The strongest thing in the world is women. <laughs> yes, women. Men cannot exist without women. And besides that, the richest man in the world will scour the world for riches and rubies and gold and silver and bring it all home and give it to the object of his affections <laughs> to make her happy. So women are the most strongest thing in the world. But then he thought about it and he says, no, wait a minute. That's my interpolation here. <laughs> Wait a minute, there's something else that's stronger than any of those three things. And do you know what it is? Can anyone guess? The strongest thing in the world, he said, was truth. Amen. And following that comes the most famous line in the entire book of First Esdras. We read... In chapter 4, verse 41, and all, um, he said, it is truth. And all the people then shouted and said, great is truth and mighty above all things. Amen. And this has been popularized yeah. in, in writing in the, uh, by the Latin, in the Latin version of, the, of Jerome's text. Magna est veritas et prevalet, meaning great is truth, it will prevail. And in the New Testament, of course, Christ said, I am the truth, John 14, verse 6. So the third guardsman's answer was acclaimed, the winning answer, and the king granted the man a wish. And we read in chapter 4, beginning at verse 43, Then said the king unto him, Ask what thou wilt more than is appointed in the writing, and we'll give it thee, because thou art found the wisest, and thou shalt sit next to me, and shall be called my cousin. Then said he unto the king, Remember thy vow which thou hast vowed to build Jerusalem in the day when thou camest into thy kingdom, and to send away all the vessels that were taken away out of Jerusalem, which Cyrus set apart when he vowed to destroy Babylon and to send them again thither. Thou also hast vowed to build up the temple which the Edomites burned when Judea was made desolate by the Chaldeans." Unquote. The king responded favorably to the request and said further in verse 50, and, all, and that all the country which they hold should be free without tribute, and that the Edomites should give over the villages of the Jews which they held. Unquote. Note a couple of important things here in the text that are not generally known. In chapter 4, verse 45, we learn that when Babylon conquered Judea, it was the Edomites, Israel's ancient hated enemies, that burned the temple of Jerusalem. Furthermore, in verse 50, the Edomites had taken over the villages of Judah, whose inhabitants had been deported to Babylon. Is this a prophetic fort type of our own day? In an end of the age prophecy found in Ezekiel 38.2, we learn that Israel's ancient enemies, Edom, will say, aha, the ancient high places are ours in possession. And this verse actually was frequently quoted from evangelical pulpits prior to World War I and used as proof 
that Turkey was Edom because Turkey then controlled Palestine. But of course, Turkey is not descended from the Edomites. So yes, Edom was to be in control of the Holy Land and its sacred places at the end of this age. But of course, the Turks are not Edom. The Edomites were conquered by John Hyrcanus in about 129 BC and forced to become Jews. And the Jewish Encyclopedia says Edom is in modern Jewry. So world affairs are now in place for the final events at the end of this age. On to the second book of Esdras. This book is an apocalypse like the book of Revelation. The Greek word apocalypse means an unveiling or a revealing. It uses a series of symbols like wild beasts with several heads and many horns as well as composite creatures, part man, part animal, giant hailstones and sea turning to blood and similar features. The book begins with a denouncing of Israel for their many sins. God would scatter Israel throughout the world and bring so-called Gentile nations into the fold. And we read more about this in 2nd Ezra. I'll read from 2nd Ezra chapter 1 verses 33 through 37. Second Ezra chapter 1, 33 through 37. Thus saith the Almighty Lord, your house is desolate. I'll cast you out as the wind doth stubble, and your children will not be fruitful, for they have despised my commandment and done the thing that is evil before me. Your houses will I give to a people that shall come, which not having heard of me, yet shall believe me, to whom I have showed no signs, yet they shall do what I have commanded them. Now doesn't that sound like a prophecy of the coming Christendom, Christ's kingdom on earth? A people who didn't know him, accepted him, and established his kingdom on earth in this age. Okay, then follows a series of visions. The central part of 2nd Ezra, chapters 3 through 14, record seven visions given to Ezra in Babylon. In the first vision, Ezra is in grief over Israel in exile and discusses the problem of evil. The angel Uriel reminds him that he cannot unravel the mysteries of his own life, so how can he understand the ways of the Most High? El Yan, the Hebrew for Most High. Man, being human and finite, cannot understand the heavenly and infinite. Ezra responds that he only seeks to understand why the Torah law of our fathers has been made of no effect and why the seeming failure of the covenants. We pass out of this world as grasshoppers, he says. The angel replied that the righteous will understand these things in the age to come. He says, Quote, you cannot comprehend the things that are promised to the righteous in time to come, for this world is full of unrighteousness and infirmities. But as concerning the things whereof you ask me, I will tell thee, for the evil is sown, but the destruction thereof is not yet come. It's coming. Then it cannot come that is sown with good. Unquote. From chapter 4, verses 27 through 29. Now, this was a quarter century before that prophesied destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And the same language was used in 2 Kings 21, verse 13, about the same event, where the Lord says, I will scour Jerusalem clean, just as one scours a plate, scouring it and turning it upside down, unquote. And that's from the complete Jewish Bible translation. Judea during the Persian era has been called by scholars a rump state. The Oxford English Dictionary defines the word rump as a small or unimportant remnant of something originally larger. And that was Judea in the Persian era, a rump state. So what happened to the vast bulk of the exiled Israelites who never returned, leaving it a rump state in Palestine? Well, 2nd Ezra provides the answer in chapter 13, verses 40 through 45. And we'll read that direct here from the text. Second Ezra 13, beginning at verse 40. Those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Hosea, the king, 
whom Salmaneser, the king of Assyria, led away captive, and he carried them over the waters, and so came they into another land. But they took this counsel among themselves, that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and yeah. go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt, in uninhabited land. And they entered into Euphrates by the narrow passages of the river. For the Most High then showed signs for them and held still the flood till they were passed over. For through that country there was a way, great way to go, namely of a year and a half. And the same region is called Arsereth. Yeah. Then dwelt they there until the latter time, and now when they shall begin to come. So what was that uninhabited land they went to? It wasn't south of Assyria, it wasn't east of Assyria, it wasn't west of uh, Assyria in Palestine, but uh, through the Caucasus yes. mountain was an uninhabited land. And I pointed out to a visitor to our church just last weekend, uh, why are we called Caucasian? Because our ancestors came out of the Caucasus Mountains from Asia Minor. And he says, oh, I never knew that. Yeah. <laughs> people don't know these things. Good. Yes. So where did they go after that? The prophet Amos tells us in Amos 9.9, 9, For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel, that's the ten northern tribes, among all nations as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Unquote. They didn't return to Palestine and they did not all die out in the exile, as some like to say. Not the least grain would fall. Well, the second vision begins in chapter 5, verse 21. And we read, Then answered I and said, What shall be the parting asunder of the times? Or when shall be the end of the first and the beginning of it that followeth? The age old struggle, in other words, for the birthright between. Oh, I, I skipped a verse. And he said unto me, from Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the heel of Esau. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. Unquote from chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. So the age-old struggle for the birthright between Esau, Edom, and Jacob, Israel, is here described as continuing right to the very end of this age with Esau in control until Jacob triumphs at the dawn of the coming age. Skipping down to the sixth vision in chapter 13, a wondrous man arises from the sea who annihilates all of his enemies. He gathers a peaceable multiple, multitude to himself. Ezra wakes and prays for interpretation of the vision. He's told that the man is the Messiah. Those who came to fight against him are the Gentiles, and the peaceable multitude are the ten lost tribes of Israel, who were exiled from the land of Canaan by Assyrian king Shalmaneser and scattered throughout the world. Now Shalmaneser, the fourth son of Tiglath-Pileser, reigned 726 to 721 BC and conquered the ten tribes of the northern house of Israel, exiling them to remote, remote parts of the northern Assyrian empire, just south of the Caucasus, where they disappeared and became lost tribes. He, did, he died at the time of the fall of Samaria, which fell after a three-year assault and was succeeded by Sargon. Interestingly, on this subject, concerning the lost tribes of Israel, the famed scholar William Whiston, translator of the standard English version of Flavius Josephus' works, which I have in my library, tried to popularize the idea that the Oriental Turks and Tartars were the lost tribes of Israel. He misunderstood the fact that the Turkish tribes, the Khazars and Avars, ancestors of Ashkenazic Jewry, were not of Hebraic descent, but had converted to Judaism. Now, the other inter interesting parts of Second Esdras of historical importance, on October 16, 1555, in front of Balliol College, Oxford, Bishops Latimer and Ridley were burned at the stake. Latimer's last words to Ridley have become famous. He said, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out, unquote. And I had the great privilege of visiting the spot where they were burned to the stake in Oxford just a few years ago. So 
his words were a reference to 2 Ezra 14.25, which says, I shall light a candle of understanding in thy heart, which shall never be put out. So you can see that inspired Latimer's famous last words to Ridley. Going back a little further in time, the famed explorer, Christopher Columbus, otherwise known as Cristoforo Colombo in Italian, was inspired to sail west across the ocean to discover America after reading a passage in 2 Esdras 6, verses 42 through 52. Verse 42 in particular states, Upon the third day of creation thou didst command that the water should be gathered in the seventh part of the earth. Six parts hast thou dried up and kept them to the intent that these some being planted of God and tilled might serve thee, unquote. So Columbus took this to mean that water covered only one-seventh of the earth, and therefore it would not be, he thought, an unusually long journey to travel west from Europe to find land. And if he had not read Second Esdras, he might never have decided to sail to America. Next, we'll take a look at the book of Tobit. One of the most widely read books in the Apocrypha is an adventure story with moral lessons we can all learn from. Do you follow the golden rule of Matthew 7.12 and Luke 6.31? It is based on Tobit 4.15. What you hate, do not do to anyone is a negative form of the New Testament golden rule. Yes. The description of the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation parallels the prayer of rejoicing in Tobit 13, verses 16 to 18, which reads, For Jerusalem shall be built up with sapphires and emeralds and precious stone, thy walls and towers and battlements with pure gold, and the streets of Jerusalem shall be paved with beryl and carbuncle and stones of Ophir, and all her streets shall say, Alleluia, and they shall praise him, saying, Blessed be the Lord, which hath extolled it forever, unquote. So you can see much of the language there in the book of Revelation uh, came from Tobit 13. Tobit's message is that God allows trials and temptations to come into our lives, yet he has a special care for us in the midst of our suffering and our trials, which often brings us to a happy ending in the end. Tobit was an Israelite of the tribe of Naphtali, one of the northern tribes of the ten tribe house of Israel. Although all of his relatives disobeyed the biblical dietary laws, my, my relatives too, <laughs> he only ate kosher food, kashrut, and maintained a faithful devotion to God in the midst of the sin and wickedness going on around him. As a result, he obtained favor in God's sight. He was a truly a role model for us today. We read in 2 Kings 15, 29, in the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ijon and Abel-Meth-Makah, Abel and Genoa, and Kedesh, and Hazor, and Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria." Unquote. Pekah reigned for about 20 years until either 732 or 731 BC, and this, con this conquest was in 732 BC, 10 years before Tiglath-Pileser's son, Shalmaneser, returned to conquer the remaining tribes of the house of Israel. The Assyrians did not invade the land of Judah until another two decades later in 701 BC, when they conquered and exiled 40 of the fenced cities of Judah, all the land of Judah except the city of Jerusalem. And they would have conquered that too, except for the earnest prayers of Judean king Hezekiah. It remained for the Babylonians almost 125 years later to exile the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem. Tobit in exile lived in the vicinity of Nineveh. And 2 Kings 17, 6 tells us that one of the exile communities was in Hala, a town 12 miles north on the Kosar River, 
where scholars believe the Israelites were employed in deepening and widening the river flowing into Nineveh to improve the watering of the famous true hanging gardens. The true hanging gardens were in Nineveh, not in Babylon. That's another story. Uh, the, the Tigris, uh, this tri tributary of the Tigris River, the Kosher River, ran directly through the center of the ancient city of Nineveh, and it watered uh, all of the hill of Kuunjik and all the beautiful flowers and plants there in that very dry, barren land. Tobit was allowed to travel freely between Nineveh and Rajiz, a town in Media where other Israelite exiles dwelled. And uh, BibleBlessings.net has a video about this subject called Israel in the Land of Fire. So you can watch that for a more fuller explanation about that. Some modern scholars believe that this book was indeed written close to the time the events took place. And it may originally have been written on cuneiform clay tablets. There remain thousands of these clay tablets which have not yet been deciphered, translated, and, and put into print. And the Book of Tobit might be among them. Some scholars believe that sometime later in the second century BC, Persian era, a Grecianized Jewish editor got a hold of the story and altered it to add mystical elements to it, which caused the entire book to be cast out largely rejected, and was relegated to apocalyptic status. Without the added mysticism, Tobit gives evidence of being a first-hand witness account about exilic life in ancient Nineveh, ancient Assyria, including facts, they say, that would not have been known to a Persian Jew living centuries later in that second century BC when they claim uh, Tobit, Tobit was written and when it finally was probably finalized. So we don't have time to retell the, this historic adventure story of Tobit. So I invite you to read for yourself this interesting look at exotic life in ancient Assyria. Next, let's look at the wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom literature was composed by wise men or sages, a position distinct from prophet or priest. Some of them wrote riddles. Look, for example, at Judges 14.4. Some wrote parables, 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 to 6. Or Proverbs. Look at our book of Proverbs in our Hebrew Bible. One of the principles of the wisdom of Solomon is that the punishment fits the crime. Remember the Torah law command, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? This command appears in Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. And Christ modified it in Matthew 5, verses 38 to 42. God used water to punish the Egyptians in the Red Sea, while water was instead a source of blessing to the Israelites, who, which provided them safe passage. And we read about that in Wisdom 11, verses 1 to 14. The author writes a scathing criticism of pagan idolatry and its demoralizing effect on society. And you can see that in America today as well. And this includes astrology, which is very popular today, promoted by regular columns in our daily newspapers. The beautiful old hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, was written in the 12th century and was inspired by chapter 8 of the Wisdom of Solomon. The second verse of our old hymn begins, O come thou wisdom from on high, direct from the wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha. Early Christians prized the wisdom book because of a text in chapter 14, verse 7. Blessed is the wood through which righteousness comes. Now, it was talking originally about Noah's Ark but was looked upon as prefiguring the cross of Christ as well, spiritually. The Anglican Church's two books of homilies contain 80 quotations from the Apocrypha, and homily 10 of Book 2 proclaims the Book of Wisdom, quote, the infallible and undeceived word of God, unquote. That's in the Anglican Church 
and the American Episcopal Church. Ecclesiasticus, the next book in the Apocrypha, also known as the Wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, and uh, also known as Ben Sirach. Ben is the Hebrew word for son. Ben Sirach. Have you ever used the expression, birds of a feather flock together? Well, if so, you're quoting from the Apocrypha. In Ecclesiasticus 27, verse 9, in a modern rendering. A number of popular Christian hymns have borrowed from the Apocrypha. The hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. Anyone know that one? Now Thank We All Our God. I see some heads nodding. It was originally written in 1636, originally in German, by Pastor Marin Rinkert. And it uses phraseology from Ecclesiasticus chapter 50, verses 22 through 24. And this book has been called the most important and most respected of the apocryphal books, and is also the longest. And it's the only apocryphal book whose author gave his name, which was Ben Sirach. An analysis by scholars seems to indicate that he was a Sadducee, a resident of Jerusalem who had traveled widely throughout the Mideast. He knows Palestinian topography very well, in other words. He wrote about 180 BC, and his grandson, name unknown, felt that the writing of his grandfather would be of benefit to the Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, who couldn't read Hebrew, so he translated for them from Hebrew into Greek in about 130 BC. One of the best known passages in the entire Apocrypha is his homily in praise of famous men in chapters 44 to 50. And you'll have to look that up yourself. I don't have time to, to read that, but it's well worth reading. Quite a beautiful passage in, fame of, in praise of famous men. He tells briefly the story of these heroes, including Enoch, Noah, Moses, Caleb, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Phineas, Nathan, David, Elijah, Eli Ezekiel, and others. Another interesting section is devoted to physicians, who Ben Sirach defends against doubt and objections. You'll find his soliloquy on doctors and medicine in chapter 38. And I would be remiss not to mention Ben Sirach's beautiful and sweet take on a good marriage. He says, do not marry a woman just for her beauty. Stumble not at the beauty of a woman and desire her not just for pleasure. And that's in uh, Ben Sirach, chapter 25, verse 21. In the next verses of Ecclesiasticus, he expounds on the need to keep your family heritage pure and, and, and unmixed. He says this, and this is interesting, worth reading, because people don't know this, and I've never heard this quoted. Where is this? In... Uh, Chapter 26, beginning at verse 19 through 21. My son, keep the flower of thine age sound, and give not thy strength to strangers. When thou hast gotten a fruitful possession through all in the field, sow it with thine own good seed, trusting in the goodness of thy stock. So thy race which thou leavest shall be magnified, having the confidence of their good descent. Amen. 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 And we won't go into it, but he also has warnings about marrying an impure wife, an impure woman. So which uh, is good advice also for many men today. <laughs> yeah. In Ezra 9, verse 12, we read something very similar. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. Unquote. Yeah. Ezra 9 verse 12. John Bunyan, I'm sure you've all heard of him, in his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, relates that he had been suffering deep despair until he read Ecclesiastes 2, verse 10, which cured his depression and inspired him 
to do his writing, including the wonderful Christian classic, Pilgrim's Progress. You might be inspired by this particular verse as well. The verse reads, look at the generations of old and see. Did ever any trust in the Lord and be confounded? Or did any abide in his fear and was forsaken? Of or whom did he ever despise that called upon him? Unquote. Some very inspiring la language in that chapter. But next we must move on to the book of Baruch. This book is asserted to have been written by Baruch, the son of Neriah, as it says in chapter 1, verse 1, who was a scribe and amanuensis who took dictation from the prophet Jeremiah. We read about him in our Hebrew Bibles in Jeremiah 32, 12, 36, 4, and 51, 59. However, biblical scholars believe that it was instead written by an unknown author living in the first century B.C., the author states that he has written this book in Babylon after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. and read it in the presence of the exiled king of Judah, Jeconiah, and other exiles by the river Sud. This was presumably the name of a Babylonian man-made canal. Any of these rivers were. We are told that the hearers were so moved that they wept, fasted, and prayed. The exiles were also asked to pray for the health of Nebuchadnezzar and his son Belshazzar so that they may dwell in Babylon in peace. Diaspora Jews adopted this book in a liturgy of lamentation on the famous date the 9th of Av, approximately in our late July, which is the traditional date for the double burning of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 BC and the Romans in 70 AD. Now, if that isn't God's judgment that he had Jerusalem conquered and destroyed twice, both on the same day of the year, the 9th of Av, mm. a day of mourning for Jews throughout the world, even today. Two early manuscripts, the Alexandrinus and Vaticanus, placed the book of Baruch immediately after the book of Jeremiah in, directly in the Hebrew canon. Next is the letter of Jeremiah. Some early biblical texts place this book immediately after the Book of Lamentations, but it is now commonly found as a final chapter six of the Book of Baruch. It is an earnest appeal to fellow Jews to not abandon the Mosaic religion and customs for paganism, a lower form of faith and life. And you'll find it also in my copy of the Apocrypha in the, as the sixth chapter of Baruch. In a sermon expounding a verse in Jeremiah 11, verse 10, which is the only Aramaic text in our Hebrew Bible, book of Jeremiah, which reads, they are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers, unquote. It's important and overlooked that the two houses of Israel are listed as completely separate entities, which is noteworthy because scholars date this letter of Jeremiah to sometime after 300 BC, and possibly as late as the Persian era in the second century. Therefore, the two houses of Israel did not rejoin at the end of the Babylonian exile in 538 BC, as is so popularly taught from our pulpits today. And, uh, so they didn't rejoin then, and at least for several centuries afterward, at least. Next is the Song of the Three Holy Children. And this is really not about adolescence. The word children is used here in the same sense as the children of Israel. It's actually about the three Hebrew exiles, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you read about in the book of Daniel who were thrown into the fiery hot furnace in Babylon. And of course, this is an expansion of the third chapter of the book of Daniel, and in fact, could be inserted between verses 23 and 24 of the third chapter of the book of Daniel. Abednego's Hebrew name was Azariah, see Daniel 1 verse 7. And he prays to God from inside the fiery furnace, praising God, confessing sins, and asking for national deliverance right there in the midst of the fire. Mm. 
Next is the history of Susanna. This is a very early form of a detective novel. The young prophet Daniel solves the crime and saves the life of a beautiful young damsel. It's a quiet, lively and quick paced story that makes enjoyable reading. It's only a short two or three pages, so I invite you to read that sometime. I don't have time to read it today. History of Susanna. Next is Bell and the Dragon. Another early detective story in which the prophet Daniel, again, <laughs> is threatened with death for not worshiping the pagan god Bel, also known as Marduk. <clears throat> Immense quantities of food were offered to this pagan god and were seemingly consumed by him every night. Daniel spread ashes on the floor and the next morning showed the king a room full of footprints leading to a secret chamber under the floor that was used by the pagan priests in their deceit. During the night, they'd sneak up from under the, under the floor of that secret chamber and they'd take all the food back down underground with them and say to the king the next day, see, the god Bel ate all that food up. Isn't he a great god? <laughs> well, their ruse was discovered and the king executed not only them, but all of their families as well. Those were rough times to live in, brutally harsh times. In part two of this book, Daniel destroys a dragon by fix, feeding it a mixture of tar, fat, and hair <clears throat> that he formed into cakes and gave it to eat, causing the creature to burst open and die. In anger, the king placed Daniel himself in the fiery furnace as punishment. And you know the rest of the story of that, or read the book of Daniel if you don't. <clears throat> so these last three books I mentioned are short stories written as additions to the book of Daniel in our Bible and are not considered authentic, but fictional short stories with moral lessons that we unfortunately don't have time to discuss further at this time. The early theologian Origen referred to these three as the three fables. <laughs> A more polite word perhaps would be novels <laughs> or novelettes. <clears throat> and novels, Christian novels, fictional novels are popular even today. Next is the prayer of Manasseh, king of Judah. This short prayer has been called a little classic of penitential devotion. It claims as its author one of the most wicked kings of Judah, Manasseh, son of the good king Hezekiah. He had a long reign of 55 years, Manasseh, that it was. And we read about him in both 2 Kings 21 and 2 Chronicles 33. And we read about Manasseh, this wicked king's repentance in 2 Chronicles 33, beginning at verse 10. And the prayer of Manasseh is a model of humiliation and repentance. I don't have time to read his whole prayer of repentance. It's a beautiful prayer. Uh, one full page prayer, beautiful prayer, very moving. And finally, we come to the last two books of the Apocrypha that we'll be able to discuss here this evening, First and Second Maccabees. The final two books in the Apocrypha, you might, you might think that Second Maccabees must be a chronological continuation of First Maccabees. I used to think that till I read it and said, whoa, it's talking about the same period of time. Repetition. <clears throat> These two books are nearly parallel histories of events in the mid-2nd century BC. Book two actually begins just a little earlier than book one and also ends about 15 years earlier. Why the need for two books about the same brief period of Jewish history? Well, there are a number of significant differences. The author of 1st Maccabees betrays a Sadducee mindset while 2nd Maccabees shows a Pharisee point of view. Book one is a fairly straightforward history book with little or no notice of any religious ideas at all. Book two has a very strong religious focus with ethereal elements added, such as a band of angel warriors who descend from heaven to help the Jews in their battle with the Macedonians. 1st Maccabees never notices the presence of any angels, which is one of the marks of a Sadducee author. They didn't believe in angels. It is a significant and little no noticed fact 
that although the two books of Maccabees meticulously and comprehensively cover the complete story of Judas Maccabeus and the Maccabee revolt, but no mention, not one word, is ever said about any so-called miracle of the oil that is the entire basis for the modern Jewish Hanukkah holiday. Historians actually report that this fable of the miracle of the oil that lasted for seven days was invented a full 500 years, half a millennium, after the supposed event immortalized in the holiday that Jews celebrate in December as a substitute for Christmas. This fact makes it clear enough that the Hanukkah story is a baseless imaginary event. And it was actually a very minor holiday until Christians began really doing up Christmas really big and Jewish children felt left out. So now instead of a Christmas tree, they've got a Hanukkah tree. They give, instead of Christmas gifts, they give Hanukkah gifts uh, and they use, have lights. Uh, one thing different is that uh, Hanukkah is known uh, for sweet, treat, sweet treats that they pass around. Uh, so uh, that's basically Hanukkah. It's just another way to celebrate and have a party, I guess. Uh, without taking the considerable time necessary to attempt to explain all of these wars and conflicts that took place during the tumultuous second century BC, there is an intriguing event concerning the Ark of the Covenant that is worth retelling in the second chapter of Book 2. And so we'll read those few verses and found in 2 Maccabees 2, verses 4 through 8. And I read, It was also contained in the same writing that the prophet, being warned of God, commanded the tabernacle and the Ark, that's Jeremiah, to go with him as he went forth into the mountain where Moses climbed up and saw the heritage of God. It's Mount Sinai. And when Jeremy came thither, he found a hollow cave wherein he laid the tabernacle and the ark and the altar of incense. Notice the three things. And so stopped the door. And some of those that followed him came to mark the way, but they could not find it. Now, if you remember the popular series of movies, I actually never saw any of them, but it seemed like everybody I knew did. Uh, the movie is called Raiders of the Lost, Lost Ark. It went through, I don't know how many, two, three, four, six, I don't know how many uh, continuations of the story. You know from that that the prophet Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch with Judean king Zechariah's daughters and other exiles after the fall of Jerusalem traveled to Tapanes, Egypt with the famed Ark of the Covenant, according to the movie. In 2 Maccabees, in contrast, it is claimed that Jeremiah hid the temple treasures, including the Ark of the Covenant, in a cave on Mount Sinai. And we're told that its location would be made known when the two houses of Israel, Ephraim and Judah, are reunited. As the text puts it, quote, it shall be unknown until the time that God gather his people again together, unquote. They're talking about his people, the two houses of Israel. If Ephraim and Judah, the ten tribes and the two tribes, are already reunited, then the Ark of the Covenant should have already been revealed by the Lord. So if you believe the text of 2 Maccabees, it is obvious that the two houses, Israel and Judah, have not yet been reunited in the prophecy of the rejoining of the two sticks in Ezekiel 37, verses 15 through 28, has not yet occurred. Tapanes, Egypt, by the way, is indeed an actual place and has been excavated by archaeologists who call the remains there the Palace of the Jews' Daughter. Yet perhaps the movie storyline of Raiders of the Lost Ark is slightly incorrect in assuming that it was the Ark of the Covenant that the prophet Jeremiah brought the panties with him. Note that 2 Maccabees does not say that the cave in Mount Sinai also received the Stone of Destiny, the Leophel. Israel's kings were crowned standing beside the sacred stone. We are told, quote, as the manner was, unquote. 2 yeah. Kings 11, verse 14. Yeah. Maybe it was not the Ark of the Covenant, but the wonderful sacred stone that Jeremiah and Baruch brought with them to Tapanes, Egypt. And if so, the question remains of where the coronation stone went after that. 
And that will have to remain a topic for another day. So we'll close with that. Thank you.